That was something we always had to do whenever I would make uh, short films and stuff with DJ, right? Is if there was anything, you always had to hide the logo. Okay, that makes sense. Well, it's so funny because brand deals are such a big thing. Well, right, but unless you actually have a brand deal, no, it makes perfect sense. you have to pay them because their logo is trademarked. What's going on? Entertain the geeky. Well, hello. Hey. We're doing it. We're on camera and everything. <laughs> this is this is something that we've been promising for ever. Yeah. And it like hadn't happened and hadn't happened. And I was like, man, we can do this. Like, I've been buying equipment to do this for a long fucking time. Now. Right. Let's just let's just make it happen. <laughs> so no, it's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. Um, okay, so this week we're doing a top five. Yep. And so it's funny. I I had been thinking about this for a little bit, and I was like, man, I really want to do um, – I want to have a couple of lists that we keep that are, like, sacred almost, and we okay. update them annually, and we say, okay – these are the things that it like if you're if you're into you know what we're into you should probably be paying attention to it absolutely because, because it's like really cool shit yeah. even if it's v- very old and very out of date most of my list is pretty modern I'm gonna be honest like mm-hmm. there are classic there's classic stuff for sure right. that is on the list that's great and worth a read but honestly man c- comics have evolved so much that the storytelling is just taken more seriously now. I, I've defended the idea for a long time that comics are literature, that this is something that can be just as compelling as, you know, any good movie you've watched or any good book you've read. Like, and that's it's literature for and sure. It's legit comics. Like yeah. that's, uh, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to do my top five, your top five. And right then on. I think what we should do is uh, we'll post on the website. We'll come up with a top five together. Okay. Okay. And that'll be like, That'll be the, the definitive list. The definitive list, yes. Because <laughs> right. I, I have a feeling we're going to be on, like, different sides of the spectrum here a little bit. Oh, I have no doubt, yeah. Um, so it's going to be interesting. So, Based w- on the fact that you used to buy comics from me. Right, you know. And I know what your taste is. <laughs> I think we're going to be on different ends here. <laughs> I wrote it down. Oh, yeah, I, was, I got all mine up here. Oh, you're brilliant. Okay. <laughs> I've been thinking about it all day. All right, so what's your number five? My number five yes. is V for Vendetta. Oh, my God. By Alan Moore. Yeah. So, first of all, I love you. Okay. <laughs> Did you Be- put that on your list? Almost. <laughs> it was actually almost number five. Okay. I went with Watchmen oh, by well, Alan right. Moore. Both of Alan Moore stories, yeah. yeah. Um, it's hard not to put him in there. No, yeah. I mean, Alan Moore, I think, today is kind of a curmudgeon weird guy, but he's definitely one of the auteurs of the comic world. Well, he, he uh, I don't know if... You could do his style of writing today. I think there are people that have definitely tried to emulate Mm -hmm. what he does uh, to varying degrees of success. Some people do it very well. Some people do it not so well. Right. Um, But I think there are definitely uh, writers who, especially when when you're writing about characters that he's written about, that have definitely been influenced by his style, right? So, like, the current Swamp thing that's going on is a perfect example. Um, it definitely has the saga of the Swamp Thing vibe to it. So you can kind of tell they're trying to capture that magic again. Right. Now, is it as good? No, but it's still pretty good. I mean, he <laughs> he was like prolific, basically. Yeah. Everything that he touched for a period of time is now like uh, what you would consider a comic masterpiece. Yeah. And I think the reason V for Vendetta is on my list at all, right, because it's one of the only two older comics that I have on my list, mm-hmm. um, is just because it, it still resonates today. It does. It is a story that is, I think, proven, at least in our era here, to be a timeless tale. Uh, you know, the, 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 the big tagline, the big through line, I think, of the story that really resonates even today is people should not be afraid of their governments. Governments should be afraid of their people. So I had said that on uh, on Who Wears the Pants to Mike one time. Yeah. And I don't know how he felt about that because I'm like, look, I'm like, at no point in time should people be afraid of the government unless they're doing something heinous. Sure. Totally different. Yeah. 
If you're, I think from the V for Vendetta standpoint, it's more about there's more of us than there are of them. Right. Well, and it's just living. Yeah. Like, that's all that story is. Yeah. I'm going to adjust your mic stand slightly here because it, ah, it's hard to see you. Okay. Oh, all right. Yeah. I just couldn't see eyeballs. They're bumming me out. Oh, 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 oh. Throwing stuff on the floor. What, what are we doing? Yeah. This thing? This thing. All right. All right. There we go. And still see me over there too. Yes. <laughs> that was that was my goal. I wanted to keep seeing you. Um, okay, so we, that's bizarre. We both picked him at number five. So yeah, I did. Uh, I did Watchmen. Watchmen would have been on my list. I'm not gonna lie, but I think, and this is probably an unpopular opinion in the comic world. I think Watchmen is a little bit overrated. Kind of. So Watchmen did it before it was like the cool thing to do. Sure. I think it's a good story. There's nothing wrong with the story. Right. It, it flows very well. It's a timeless tale, just like V for Vendetta. It just, everyone's all, oh, you gotta read Watchmen. And I always just feel like, you don't have to read Watchmen, right? Like, it's a good history lesson in the, in the comic industry. But if it's not your thing, it's not your thing. And I think it's just never been my thing. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Number four. Number four for me is Batman Hush. Ooh, that is a modern one. It is, uh, so it's not Relatively super modern. modern. It's 2008, I believe. I was going to say, it, it last 20 years. Is, yeah, yeah. I feel like is It was, uh, but I think the, the reason, uh, uh, there's two Batman stories on my list. Uh, the first one is Batman Hush, really just because it was, first of all, Jim Lee drawing Batman, which is something everybody wanted. Jim Lee had, right. had drawn for Marvel for a long time, and when the image stuff started, he kind of shifted and really was was doing stuff with them and working with McFarlane. He was one of those early guys. Um, but when I remember when they announced that Jim Lee was going to draw Batman, I mean, the comic industry lost their minds, <laughs> right? And I, I think Jim Lee's a great artist. There's no doubt. His stuff's always been a little too clean for me. Okay. It's beautiful. There is no doubt. But sometimes it's nice to see the sketch lines and the process of bringing a character to life through, really? through art and so Jim Lee's art is just clean. It's very clean, mm-hmm. and it looks mm-hmm. beautiful, but it's almost too clean. It almost that's why it's that's why this is not higher on my list. Is just the art is a little too clean. Okay, um, but the story is great because Jim Lee was drawing Batman. He got every character involved. I mean, literally every Batman villain, with the exception of Mister Freeze, I think is the only one that's not a part of that story. Uh, <laughs> because Riddler, Joker, Two Face, Clayface. Uh, I mean, every villain. They're all Poison Ivy. They're all part of that story. Catwoman, Harley Quinn. Hells yeah. He got, he got to, he wanted to draw the characters, so he did. He managed to fit them all into one story, and it didn't feel forced. Well, and when you're, when you're at that point in time, Jim Lee try, drawing Batman, they're like, what characters do you want to draw? Yeah. Fuck yeah, no, take all Just of them. all of them, yeah. <laughs> We've got more if you want them. Right. And so, not only did he manage to fit all of those characters into the story, but they all fit so well within the narrative he'd crafted for them. I the roles that. that they played within the story actually made sense, mm. right? It wasn't just like, oh, he's just drawing him to draw him. No, mm-hmm. like he has a role within the story and it made sense to the narrative. Plus, that's where they really changed uh, the story of Jason Todd, yep. right? Because I don't know if people remember, this has been a long time ago, but uh, the reason Jason Todd died and then came back was because in one of the crisis stories, Superboy Prime was stuck in the nexus of realities and watching all the realities unfold around him on like screens. And he got really angry and he was trying to get out of there and he started punching reality. I mean, literally that's what it, what he was punching reality. Right. Uh, and that sent ripples and shockwaves across the universe, across the multiverse. And one of those shockwaves brought Jason back to life. Now, that was a bad story. That was a bad way. I mean, the story wasn't bad. That was a bad way to bring Jason back to life. Sure. So later, it was retconned that he was actually put into a Lazarus pit by Rachel Ghoul, hmm. who felt guilty for uh, having a hand in taking one of the Batman's allies because he respects the Batman so much. So they did a Red Hood story called The Lost Days that kind of retconned the whole thing. Jeremy Hahn did the art for that. Beautiful, beautiful art. Um, But so that was kind of the story where, for the first time, we saw canonically how this was affecting the Bat world. Okay. And I love Jason. Jason is, I mean, he's not my favorite Robin, but he is a great, tragic character. Um, 
if you're, you know, if, uh, in fact, higher up on my list is a story that's really just about Jason called Under the Red Hood. That is a brilliant story, but we'll get to that later. But uh, he's just a tragic character. I mean, he's he's a kid who Batman gave this responsibility to. He saw the rage and the anger that was building up in this kid, and he thought, I need to focus that. And so he did, and then he was surprised when it led to his death, right? Which you shouldn't be. You, you literally took a, a troubled child and you gave him weapons and told him he was a superhero. It's and like you didn't expect there, him right. to be reckless. I mean, right. come on. Uh, that, was, that was the one time Batman, I think, made a mistake <laughs> about who he chose. Fair. But what it led to was Red Hood, who is a fantastic character and just tragic. And one of those characters that while he still uses his guns and he kills people, Batman's okay with that because he's effective and he really can't stop him. It's like you're kind of a cool dude, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so Hush was kind of the story where they, where Batman found out okay. that Jason was still alive. Where Batman found out that, and at the end of that story, Batman didn't even believe that until we got to Under the Red Hood, which came later. Uh, because Clayface was like posing as Drake or, or as uh, Jason, Jason during yeah. that story. Um, so there was, yes, Jason's back or... Not? Who knows? Stay tuned. <laughs> so not only was it a great story in its own right, but it left us wanting more. I was going to say, they, they give you a, a nice cliffhanger there on that. Yeah. So I I had to put Frank Miller on my list. Sure. Okay, and I was Nothing like... Nothing wrong with Frank Miller. I was like, man... Um, I mean, he's not a great artist, but he's a good writer. <laughs> I mean, he's got that like dirty art style. I'm surprised you don't like it. it for Dark Knight Returns, if that's what you're you're discussing here... Are you, are you, is Dark Knight Returns the one you're so going with? It, it, um, it was, it, I, at first, it was a toss-up between that and Daredevil Born Again. But yes, oh, I sure. did go Dark Knight Returns. Okay. Um, because the yes. artwork fits it so well. I think, yes, his art worked well in that era for that story. Yes. But later, when he did uh, Dark Knight, the Master Race, the third Dark Knight mm-hmm. story, um, he wasn't doing the art. Andy Kubert was doing the art, and his style worked really well. He tried to mimic Frank Miller's style quite a bit. Um, but Frank Miller was doing little backup stories, and they were terrible. The art was terrible. Really? <laughs> it just was not good. See, I, th- that grizzled Batman that came in in that story was fun, and it was it was good for the time. Like, yeah. very good for the time, and it's uh, getting to... Uh, one of the things that made me so appreciative of that was getting Affleck's Batman. Oh, sure. Because, it definitely influenced who he became. Oh, big time. And I Absolutely. was like, fuck, dude. Getting to actually see him, not just in the comic, because the comic was fantastic, but uh, it, like somehow my mind put them together, and I was like, same, same, same. Yeah. Yeah, and The Dark Knight Returns, I think the reason, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Affleck's Batman. The thing I think that separates them is in The Dark Knight Returns, when Batman was training the army of the Bat, the, yes. the, the sons of Batman, yeah. I think he called them. yeah. One of the first things he says is he, he snatches a shotgun out of one of their hands, breaks it over his knee, and says, this is the weapon of the enemy. We do not need it. We will not use it. So I think that's what separates him. Oh. And, and so the influence is there in the look, but right. in the way the character's portrayed, they are night and day. And part of that, I think, is just the writing. Um, Frank Miller was very much a Batman purist. Absolutely. Yeah. And like that's wonderful to see and Zack when Snyder was not right exactly <laughs> in any sense of the word um he was just trying to put his fingerprint on it I think yeah and he's like oh fucking Batman kills I mean the, when you look at the movies he's right right I mean we literally saw Michael Keaton strap a bomb to a dude's chest and shove him into a hole in the ground yeah and burn a guy alive with the afterburner of the Batmobile so like yes in the movies Batman's a murderer if for the, sure if that if that if <laughs> That is your comic know-how. <laughs> but if you're, yeah, if you're trying to capture the comic, you're wrong. Well, Batman is not a murderer. Well, and that's where you run into the issue. If you're trying to capture the character, because the character is well-established. Yeah. Well-established. He and, will not kill you. No, d- not his thing. He doesn't even kill the Joker. Who's a prick? Total well, and, prick. And, and that comes in, in Under the Red Hood, where he literally says, look, would it? you think it would be hard? No, it would be easy. But if I allow myself to go down into that place, I'll never come back. Right. Batman's basically saying if he crosses the line, he'll be the most effective serial killer in the world. 
He knows that. Right. Because he's skill a crazy. Level, yeah, his skill level means he would be the best serial killer. No one that he wanted to, to die would be alive. Everyone he wanted to die would die. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, when you're talking about the guy that has contingency plans for the Justice League. like his contingency plan for himself. Right. right. seeing that play out right now. He's, it's yeah, a no, he robot could kill- he created called Failsafe. Course it is. So, no, it's awesome. Chip Zdarsky is <laughs> currently writing a, he's Batman. He's such a dick. <laughs> and it's fantastic, right? He created a robot that is plugged into media feeds so that if there is ever information that the Batman has murdered someone, the failsafe is activated. It's Batman's plan to stop himself. Oh, well, now, now. Because, again, he knows he'd be the most effective serial killer in the world. Say, now, this is some huge <laughs> foreshadowing here because we know that Batman is going to be, you know, Framed, right? And the failsafe is going to be activated, and he's going to have to then. He was okay. That's there how we the, go. The story started. There Penguin, we go. Penguin is dead, and he's made it look like Batman was the one who killed him. Now, in the past, Alfred was there to uh, to tell the failsafe system when something was a false flag type thing, when gotcha. it was somebody trying to frame the Batman. But Alfred ain't there no more. Alfred is dead. So the <laughs> failsafe system didn't get the message, and it thinks Batman murdered the Penguin. It's fantastic. <laughs> okay, okay. So, number three. Yes. Number three. What have you got? Uh, for me, number three is Under the Red Hood. Under the Red Hood. Okay, okay. Uh, but my two Batmans, uh, it's weird that a, a Batman story is not number one for me, because it's not a Batman story. My number one, we'll get to in a little bit, is not a Batman story, but it's Under the Red Hood. Uh, again, I love Jason. I think Jason is a tragic character. Um, he comes back to Gotham as this enigma, this mystery that Batman has to solve this guy wearing a red hood and uh, murdering villains and, and mafia guys and basically uh, taking control of the criminal underworld in order to control crime, right? right? Something that he, he thinks is the logical next step in what Batman does. And it's brilliant when he calls the, the heads of the mafia families together and he tosses the duffel bag down and they open it. It's literally the heads of all their lieutenants. And he says, I did that in an hour. <laughs> because he's good at this, right? right he was right. trained by the Batman. badass. Yes. Um, but it builds to one of the most emotional moments uh, between Jason and Bruce, uh, where he's captured the Joker, he's tortured him, and Batman arrives, and he well, he's trying to force Batman to kill the Joker. And Batman is is denying it, denying it, not going to do it. And Jason has this tear, you know, tears running down his face moment where he says, look, I'm not talking about killing Penguin or Two-Face or Riddler or Dent, just him. And doing it because he took me away from you. And it's a, it's a moment that shows everything Jason is doing is because he loves Batman. Because Bruce is his father. Right. Right? And, and it's... Uh, it's just, it's such a heartfelt story that is tragic. I mean, he's one of the most tragic characters on the side of good, right? There's the, the reason Batman is such a resonating story, I think, is because even on the villain side, there are villains that you sympathize with. His villains are tragic. Two-Face. Two-Face could have been the, the one who guy. ended yeah. organized crime in Gotham City, yep. except for that one moment. Mr. Freeze could have been the one who cured a deadly disease that was afflicting his wife until that, that crossroads moment, right? So I think that's what makes his stories so good is that they're tragic. They really, look, is Jason a cold-blooded killer? Absolutely. But you sympathize with him. Why, you understand why, exactly. why he's doing what he's doing. And I think that's what makes him such a compelling character. Mm. And I think that's what allows Bruce to kind of ignore the things he does. Let him be the guy he is because... Bruce failed him. Bruce failed him great. Big time, yeah. He let him get tortured and murdered by the Joker. Now, arguably, he didn't let that happen, but it, through his own it, negligence, yes, exactly. it happened. And he blames himself for that. I mean, that's hell, hell, that's the whole reason Tim Drake became Robin. Because Tim saw in Bruce a person who was untethered from the moral compass. In the aftermath of Jason's death, Bruce was brutal. He was far more brutal than he had ever been. Uh, and Tim saw that and saw that Robin is what balances Batman. So Jason was part of that balance too. In, in fact, Jason is, because Dick, look, 
Hush had a great line about all, all of these people. Dick saw being Robin as a performance. It's probably why he outgrew it. Jason saw being Robin as a game. It's probably what got him killed. Tim, Tim wants to be the greatest detective in the world, and he will be one day. And it's such a beautiful, to look at all of these, 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 these guys who have Carried the filled mantle. the same yeah. role in Batman's life and how different all of them have taken it. All of them have looked at it differently. And it's, it's and Jason, arguably, like I said, Jason, I think, is the most tragic among them. Oh, for sure. And, and that's why Under the Red Hood is absolutely a story that you should read. Judd Winnick, Doug Bonke, read it. It's brilliant. It's such a good Batman story. So my, my number three is Scarlet Spider Volume 2 with Kane Parker. Of course it is. Of course it of is. Of course it is. Um, <laughs> that's a duh. It's so good. Um, that one was by Chris Yost. And uh, Ryan Stegman started off doing the artwork in it, and they kind of shifted artists around yeah, and stuff yeah. like that with it was that series. It, it was, but the the series was good. And what I really, really liked about it is, um, so the whole series is positioning somebody who sees themselves as a monster, and it, like they're on the run. Then this is Kane Parker. He is a clone of Spider Man. Oh no, not the Clone Saga! The Clone <laughs> Saga, um, and he. Is on You're the talking run. about aftermath of the Clone this Saga, is, yeah, That way, was much better than the Clone is, Saga. This is way, way, way after that. <laughs> well, and I feel like we've kind of redeemed all the clones at this point in some way because other writers have taken it and unmolested it. Sure. Um, so we have Kane. He's on the run because the Jackal wants to get him because he's, you know, the the first failed experiment. But he's a super badass, and he uh, he is given by Peter Parker Spider-Man's stealth suit on Spider Island. So yeah. he's kind of using that to maintain a low profile, and he ends up in Houston, and he, he fucking saves some people. And they're like, oh, you're a hero. And he's like, I'm not a hero. Not a hero. Right. And, like, his whole story is being in denial of being a hero, but he starts making all these friends, and, like, it, he, he befriends a cop, and he's like, he'll help this cop randomly. Right. Um, he, he's just got all these people and they, they see him being a hero. And it's like, dude, at some point you have to give up on this past years where you were made to be something else because you get to make your own destiny. I think yeah. that's the thing about that story. That's so cool. And then they transition that into the spider verse thing. And he's the scion. He's the freaking sacrifice. Yeah. Like it was totally badass. and how they did his character. I was like, man, <laughs> Plus, he had a really good. good costume. His costume's bitching. His costume is really good. It's fucking sick. <laughs> you were a hundred percent right. Yeah. Well, because the stealth suit was cool. Yeah. The black and red that they gave him, though, the man, black and red was so good. It yeah. was so good. When I when I was recently replaying uh, the Spider Man, yeah, the new Spider Man mm -hmm. game, I played the whole game in that costume. Did you? That costume is brilliant. It, yeah. It's such a cool costume. They have well, both of his costumes in there, but the the all red one with oh, the black sick. is much better than the original well, one. <laughs> they uh they did a team up with him in um and Superior Spider Man, yep, and uh, Wolverine at one point. Mm -hmm. And with the Wolverine team up, they put him like in the cover. He's in the regular stealth suit. Yeah. And and then the comic, it's like, no, he's he, don't worry about that. Yeah, he's not yeah. wearing that silly thing. Uh -huh. And you're yeah. like, thank God, he's got the black and red, and it's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I wanted to have a suit made so bad that was that suit. Right. I, oh, I love I mean, it. You definitely got the body type for a a Spider Man costume. Kane is big though. Yeah, is but big. but when I say that, I'm talking about like me versus you, <laughs> sure, right? I couldn't sure. wear a skin tight spandex suit. You could, right? Well, yeah, but, okay, like I'm all about staying true to a character. Like, okay, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine irritated the piss out of me. He's just too big. Yeah, he did, he did a good job. Tall. He is. He's six two. Yeah, like, Wolverine's he, supposed to be like it's like five something, five yeah, seven. Five foot. Yeah, no, I no. Don't. He's five two is his actual yeah, I height. Say, I think it's like five but one, five two. Finding a real human being, I'm like, yeah, do there somebody is. that's his name seven. is Bob Hoskins. I don't know who this is. Bob Hoskins was in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. He was the detective that was working with Roger, the chubby was, guy. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just so like, yes. Is he? Is he if, a little? Is he not buff? No, he's not buff, but. When how old somebody is he now? did uh, he's too old now. Yeah, I was gonna say, but yeah. somebody did. Uh, I think it was Boss Logic did a piece of art with Bob Hoskins playing Wolverine, cigar in his mouth, crazy hair. 
it was perfect. I was just like, God, that would be amazing. Dude, I saw one uh, <laughs> that they did of Zac Efron as Wolverine, and I was like, done. I'm in. I think he's still a little too tall, though. He is. He is. He, so he's like my height. He's 5'10". The, the problem with, with Wolverine is when Wolverine is standing in front of other characters, he should literally have to look up. To, well, to lock their, that, their that's days. that's where you do some forced perspective and you bust out your sure. Hobbit camera. Tom Hardy is not that tall, but they made him look as tall as Christian Bale when he was in Dark Knight Rises. I think they're close to the same height. Christian Bale's a little too. He's like yeah, but Christian five, Bale's eight, a five, little nine. taller, and they wanted Bane to look more imposing. So there was a lot of forced perspective in okay. there where okay. they showed him in you know in the background making him look more imposing. Okay, yeah, but plus get, he wore lifts on his shoes. Get get yeah no that. Tom Hardy is a guy that's been floated as as a as a so good is Daniel character, Radcliffe. As a good guy who to play Wolverine. Daniel Radcliffe has shot that down. He's like, I never want to sign a contract again <laughs> to 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 keep me keep me going for ten movies. I'm not doing that Fuck anymore. Fuck, dude, I would if, if, <laughs> if somebody came to my door right now and was like, Chris, do you want to um, be this character in this silly Marvel movie? <laughs> and you know, it's for an undisclosed amount of time. We're probably going to drop you at some point in time, or you're going to get cancer. I'd be like, done. Let's go. Where do I sign up? Yeah, but he he spent the formative years of his life locked into right. a contract to play Harry Potter. So I understand his perspective on right. it. Right, he's a baby. He was yeah. a baby and I do understand his perspective that. on it. Yeah. No, that would be rough. Yeah. With that being said, fuck man. But Boss Logic also did art of Hardy as Wolverine. And I, yeah, and it looks cool as shit. I think he'd be good. Yeah, I really do. Either one, yeah, they would both be <laughs> baby's pissed. <laughs> they could both be good choices. I just Man, I just got my heart set on Efron. Now it looks like he's going to be the Human Torch. Oh yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't th- look. There's been a lot of rumors flying around. I don't believe anything until I hear it from Kevin Feige at this point. <laughs> I mean, you know, I said that, and I said that, and I said that, and then all of a sudden, there, like the guy that everybody was saying was Mister Fantastic shows up. Yeah, and but he's that Mr. was fucking that fantastic. Was, that was fan service, and Kevin Feige even admitted that he was like, that, "No, that was just fan service because you guys wanted it to happen, so we did it because yeah. we're in the multiverse. It doesn't really matter." Well, you shut the fuck up and you do that all the time because it was good. I I don't think Krasinski is going to be coming back to play Probably not. MCU Reed. I think they're going to skew younger with MCU. You read. I think I'm they want to. Sh- I'm wanna sure they will younger. have him have him in his you know. 30s. Especially because if you skew younger with Reed, you skew even younger with Johnny, and you can have the Human Torch Spider Man friendship that we never right. got to see in the movie because they're best friends. They're in the comics. They're best friends. Johnny and Peter, best friends. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That would be that would be a really interesting one. Yeah, I like seeing that dynamic. Yeah. Uh, but I digress. Yeah. So number three, Scarlet Spider, Volume Two for me. All right. So, um, number two for me? Number two. So, I said there are two classic comics on my list. Ooh. Uh, and while this is not a classic comic insofar as it was written in the 80s, it was written in 2000, which is 22 years ago at this point. Are you going to say League of Extraordinary Gentlemen? No, because oh, okay. that predates that as well. Okay. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was 89, Was 90. it that early? Yeah. I yeah. thought I thought it, it was... pretty far back, but he continued writing stories about it, so I it went say... through the 90s. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's where I was confused. Uh, Ultimate Spider-Man. Oh, which... Oh, Miles Morales, Ultimate Spider-Man? No, Peter, nope. Ultimate Spider-Man. I love Ooh. Miles, don't get me wrong. The original Ultimate Spider-Man run that Brian Michael Bendis and Mark Bagley did... Ah, is it's so good. Consistently one of the best comics I've ever read. So fucking good. And I don't even like Spider-Man. Right? I mean, I like Spider-Man, right? Everybody Good else. series, though. I don't read Spider-Man. Like, I don't read Amazing. Uh, the only time I tend to read Spider-Man is when... There's a crossover or something. different. Yeah. So, like, when Superior Spider-Man was happening. I was all about that. That was a great book. Um, I don't know. I just... The, the normal, like, adult Peter is just kind of bland to me, and I'm not really into it. But the reason I Ultimate Spider-Man resonated with me is because he was young. It was, we're showing you a kid in high school who's having right. to balance his life as a high school student with his life as being a superhero. And aside from Todd McFarlane, uh, the Brent Bendis and Bagley are the longest running creative team on a single comic book consecutively. Uh, because Todd hmm. McFarlane has the record for longest writing on Spawn. Right. Because right. Spawn's it's his. 200 and something issues at this point. Uh, <laughs> but the original Ultimate Spider-Man series went to 131. 131 was the final issue of that book. They relaunched it shortly after that. Yeah, I was going to say, they relaunched it shortly there. 131 was the final issue of that book. And while uh, there was a short time in the early hundreds where Mark Bagley was not drawing it, he did come back at the end to draw the finale of the story. 
So the up to, they went over a hundred issues with that same creative team. So that is uh, in a Marvel from the Marvel side. That is a, that's record. ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. For longest running single creative team. Well, cause um, uh, McFarlane stepped away from spawn for a minute there uh, yeah. at issue 200. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is he still not doing it? No, he's still he's back again. I was gonna yeah. say I he's thought, launched a bunch of new titles now. There's I was King gonna say, Spawn and Scorched and Gunslinger Spawn. Yeah, I, I, I follow him on Instagram and stuff, yeah. and I'm like, dude, you still fucking do Spawn? I thought you were done with Spawn. What nope. happened? He, I guess, realized that that was uh, his a cash baby. cow. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Ultimate Spider Man, I, 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 there's not a bad it's, issue of that it's book. Really good. I mean, every issue of that book was so good. I mean, everything from even the goofy things where, like, they did that story where Wolverine and Spider-Man swapped brains. Right. Like a Freaky Friday thing. Even that was great in how it was written and how it was presented to us. It was goofy, but it was fun. Bendis has an, he has an ability to do some really fucking cool stuff. Yeah. Like, some really cool stuff, and it shouldn't be cool. Like, yeah. that's, that's, I'll, I'll give him that. Some of the stuff that well, he's done, I was like, oh. And getting to redesign characters, getting to do Goblin, right? Right. As a, as an actual monstrous Hulk style transformation, getting to do uh, electro in a more modern way where his costume didn't look silly as hell. Right. Uh, his take on Kingpin was fucking brilliant. It was badass. Kingpin and the enforcers. I mean, God, that was so good. His doc Ock and, and, and they, they did something that the Marvel cinematic universe would come to emulate later where a single event spawned everything about right. this world. Otto becoming Dr. Octavius, Peter becoming Spider-Man, Norman becoming the Goblin, Electro. All of this spawned from the experiment, the Oz experiment yep. that Norman performed on himself. Right? So the MCU would later come to emulate that with Tony. I mean, yes. look at all the Spider-Man stuff. Tony is responsible for Spider-Man's villains. Like, absolutely responsible for why they're villains and why they targeted Peter. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, we would, we would come to emulate that later because it was just really well done. Ultimate Spider-Man was so good. Yeah, the ripple effect that that single event in the early moments of the story had resonated in the, throughout the entire series. That, that had to have been one that was really cool to get to do 50, 60 years after that character came out. I yeah, mean, I mean, you weren't chained to continuity. How, how old was, I guess it was 45 at that point in time, right around there. Yeah, 62 was when Spider-Man, yeah, Amazing yeah. Fantasy 15 came out. So, yeah. It was about 40, 45 years old. Yeah. That would have been so badass. Yeah, I mean, you, you basically got to reset and tell the story right. the way you wanted to tell it. The Ultimate Universe, in general, had some really great storytelling because of that. Well, th that was one of the things about the Ultimate Universe, or the uh, MCU. Everybody was like, it's the Ultimate Universe. Do you remember that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That conversation was being had all the time, and I'm like, I don't think so. I think I think There was definitely influences, having right. Nick Fury be Samuel L. Jackson, well, was yeah. clearly influenced by the Ultimate of course, Universe. Of course, um, their take on Tony Stark was very much influenced by the Ultimate version of Tony Stark, with the exception of the tumor thing. Right. Um, hell, their 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 take on Captain America was very similar. Their take on using Hulk as uh, kind of a villainous role early on in the Avengers film came directly from the Ultimate Universe. That was the first villain they fought was Hulk. That was also I <laughs> Hulk was a a necessity like the way that they did him yeah. because it, they had just lost or they didn't lose an actor for it they brought him on there to screen test with Ed Norton yeah and then they were like ah you're a dick no yeah. <laughs> let's get Mark in here so yeah. they bring him in and they were like well we can't fucking and he's not a good character to star in a movie typically typically sure not I as, think that's about to change well of course uh, or are they watched She-Hulk right are they getting him from Universal though because that's yeah the, the rights revert back to Marvel next year no shit. Yeah. The the way the movie rights work is you have to make a movie every so often or you don't retain the rights. Yep. And Universal has not made a Hulk movie since 2008. Yeah. So literally, oh, if incredible. they don't make a movie in the next six months, Marvel gets the rights to Hulk back. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and they're obviously planning World, World War Hulk. I well, mean, if you watched She-Hulk. I was going to say, we kind of got it a little bit. Or no, I'm thinking Planet, Planet Hulk. Hulk. I'm thinking Planet Hulk. The I'm story sorry. that followed Planet Hulk yes, was is World, World War Hulk. Hulk. Yes, but obviously it's going to play out kind of differently because the reason World War Hulk happened in the comics was because Hulk was pissed yes. because they shot him into space. Mm -hmm. The Illuminati shot him into space, and he came back to with an army behind him to destroy the Avengers. So that's going to play out a little differently in the movies because Hulk's not an enemy in this story, but 
She-Hulk uh, spoilers out there for anybody. <laughs> I'm about to spoil something very major. So if you don't want it spoiled, turn away. Uh, She-Hulk introduced us to Scar. Yeah. So clearly we're building to some kind of, and the plot of She-Hulk, the fact that we're bringing back the leader for the new Captain America movie and we're bringing back the same guy who played him in The Incredible yeah. Hulk, uh, and the leader's whole thing was getting, or at least in the movies, the leader's whole thing was getting blood from mm-hmm. you know, gamma radiated blood. He wants to create an army, whatever. So I think World War Hulk in the movies is going to take the form of Hulks are now being produced by the leader and the good Hulks have to stop that. Similar to Armor Wars, right? right. right? Which we also are going to see on Disney+. Plus. Actually, yes. no, I think they've changed that. I think it's uh, no, be I think movie. it's going to be a movie now. Yeah, I think it's yeah. going to be a movie now. Yeah, I think you're right. So, you heard it here first. Pretty sure that's what <laughs> World War Hulk is going to be. I'm calling it right now before we have any information about it, but I'm pretty sure that's what's going to be. Just made this up, kind of. There's some context <laughs> clues here. It could go either way. No, I've been literally talking about this since She-Hulk ended. I, I'm pretty sure this is where we're going. Now, I don't know. I'm not Kevin Feige, and I'm not plugged into that I'm world real... at all. Kevin? Kevin? <laughs> hey, buddy. Um, okay, my number two, yes. you actually mentioned, is Superior Spider-Man. It's so fucking good, dude. It's a dude. really good story. It's so good. And I, as I was, as I was going to spoil something that's fucking seven years old right now. What? Um, at the end of it, so, okay, I guess I need to start somewhere earlier. We'll we'll get to the end. I'll fill you in first. At the end of Amazing Spider-Man, Dr. Octopus inserts his consciousness into Peter's body. Yeah, he's dying. He is dying. He, he switches th- them. He then becomes Spider-Man. And he makes a vow to Peter in, in the final moments of Doc Ock's life where he says, I will be better. Yeah, I'll be the superior I'll be Spider-Man. I'll superior. Yep. Yeah. So he runs off... And is doing Spider Man, and he's fucking ruthless. He's great at and it, badass. That's mentioned. He finishes Peter's doctorate. He does. He does. He gets really angry at the beginning of that book by not being called Doctor Parker. Yep. He's like, I, I'm Doctor Octavius. That is who I am, and I will not not be a doctor. <laughs> gets his doctorate. Yeah. Starts a company, Parker Industries. Yeah. Dates dates a uh, a a small person who is also a minority. Yep. All kinds of stuff outside of what is normal for a Spider-Man book. That was book. the best thing about that book is it shattered the norms. When it was, he was, his fucking brutality was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible. His, he has this like Tony Stark-esque thing where he's going to start policing with these spider drones. Well, the spider drones were twofold. Yes, they were for policing, but also they helped him balance his life with Peter Parker, of which course. is something Peter never, never was able to do. Exactly. Right? Like, I'm in the middle of a date, and i got to go run off and put on my costume to do a thing. Right back. No, let the bots handle it. Exactly. The bots can handle that armored car robbery or whatever the hell it was. He, <laughs> he was so creative about how he was Spider-Man. Yeah. And you see, uh, as the story unfolds, there's this little piece of Peter that didn't leave his head. Yep. And it's kind of conscience in there. And Otto starts to realize that that might be there, but Peter's still able to kind of hide in the recesses of his the mind. Subconscious, yeah. Yes. So they they go about this and they start navigating. Well, then uh, Green Goblin shows back up. Is basically how the story with ends. With a different face. Exactly, with a different he face. Had, like plastic surgery. Norman Osborn did the face-off thing. He yeah, Nick yeah. Cage, John Travolta it. <laughs> <laughs> and he shows up and is just being a total asshole like he does. And he's kicking fucking Dr. Octopus's ass. Yeah. And it's because he, he knows his game. Well, right. And, he, he, and Osborn knows Peter so well at this point that the moment they come face-to-face and Peter says something, Otto's like, you're not Peter. Exactly. He knows immediately that that's not Peter. And the coolest shit is, and the coolest line in that story, and I teared up, this is the part that I was getting to. So fucking, you turn the page, and Otto's like, dude, you you were always the superior Spider-Man. You have to do this. And it was so fucking cool. That was my biggest problem with the book. Oh, I'm going to be God. honest with you. It was, that was him, like, that was his fucking arc coming to a beautiful spot. And that was him being a, a real hero. It was really just public pressure and editorial pressure to get Peter back into the story. I won't. I won't deny that how they did it was so the problem. Graceful. The problem that I have with that is 
the, the 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 person that he was during the Superior Spider Man arc had developed relationships. He had yes. started dating Anna, who was tutoring him in something. I don't even remember what she. Right. That's how she was introduced, though. She was tutoring him, mm-hmm. uh, and she's a little person, which was immediately the shattering of a norm that had become part Peter of Parker. comics, right? Because Peter Parker in general he dates supermodels, superheroes date supermodels, right? Oh yeah, that's fair. That's, they're that's, all that's they're a all, trope yeah. within the comics. Superheroes date supermodels, and Mary Jane was actually a supermodel. That's why that I was said her that. job. Yes. Uh, so shattering that norm and seeing that love can come in all shapes and sizes was beautiful. We had, t- that, we had taken a huge step forward. To bring Peter back took 10 steps back because we literally <laughs> just put it back to exactly the way it was. He lost his company. He, uh, there was no way he was going to get out of that relationship with Anna without looking like a huge douche because Anna right. doesn't know that that was someone else in control. Yep. She knows Peter. That's how he presented himself. He was Peter, right? So the the story had taken huge strides in making Spider-Man a better character. And then when they brought Peter back, we just took 10 huge steps back and we said, screw all that. I see. I, and I, I'm just looking at it different than you were because I was like, man, that was, that was Otto Octavius being a hero. That was fucking cool. Because like you said, he had built up all these relationships. He built up this, you know, bajillion dollar company. Life was fucking good. Yeah. For Pete. And, and guess then, what? And then guess what? Peter came back and, and screwed fucked it all, all that up. Immediately. <laughs> immediately fucked it all up. Yes. That's why Superior Spider-Man's good. But the, the, the <laughs> cool thing that they did with it was the issues that they threw in after it was over. Because he... Yeah, they did those, those Spider-Verse 2 issues. Yes. That explained what happened to him when he walked through the portal. Exactly. Yeah, and that whole that whole story... Well, the Spider-Verse that, that thing literally was... literally in, in, the, in the comic book took panels right in the in actuality he was gone for years right or months or whatever it, i think it was, it was months yeah, yeah during the spider-verse story which was that was oh, a was cool great story. ass story man yeah, it really was i actually i so i own all the comics to that and i was like all the uh you know single issues and i was yeah. like man i need to get the trade for that pick up the trade for it just because i'm like i'm gonna read it again and i don't want to fucking i, think I still my have a big issues. hardcover of spider-verse that collected all of it yeah, I sh- I thought about buying the hardcover. I mean, it's like a hundred dollars. I was gonna say that's it's, why it's like I the whole thing. That's why I didn't buy it. <laughs> I got the main story and trade paperback, and I was like, "That's good enough." Uh, all right, I love I love the story. Don't no, get me it's, wrong; it's great. And that that's the biggest problem I have with it is it's so good that there was nothing that could have come after it that was going to make it better, right? And that then that's what happened. It was terrible after that. <laughs> I remember being bummed out that uh, that Peter was not Spider Man. However, I was very intrigued by Doctor Octopus Spider Man, and yeah. that's what made Superior Spider Man so much fucking fun. Yeah, no, it was a great book. So much fun. I still have my nine eight CGC graded copy of number one. Mm. <laughs> Got that from Paul. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he never paid us. He never paid you. Our, our <laughs> so he did. He did the first two times, and then when you quit. Oh, he just stopped paying. Yes. Yeah. We, we had a bad falling out. Yes, yes, yeah. we did. We're still friends to this day, but we realized while we worked in close proximity to each other one is word. that we're both too stubborn and bullheaded to get along with each other. That's too funny. It because le- he said something to me, and I reacted poorly, and then he escalated the situation, and then it became like, I'm literally yelling at this man in his own house. <laughs> And I quit. His business model is fucking awesome, though. Oh no, he's a great guy. I'm, I'm not. I have nothing bad to say. No, about he's, he is. He is a good dude. I still suggest people sell their comics to him. If you're looking to sell your whole collection, Cloud sell it Nine to Paul. Comics. Cloud Nine Comics, man, they're great. He'd give you more money than any store is gonna, for sure. Um, it's true. It's true. So, so number one was hard, right? Ooh. I to the two stories, the two books that I got into when I first started getting into comics were Batman, obviously, and right. X Men. So I wanted to put an X-Men story somewhere on the list. So I had a, a, a list, I'm not kidding you, of like 15 of what I consider to be some of the best X-Men stories ever written. Mm-hmm. And I had to whittle that down to one. Um, and surprisingly, uh, upon actually reflecting, because I was at work all day, I was talking about comics, I was, I was asking my customers about this. Uh, oh, I'm so glad I asked you that <laughs> on Wednesday. Yeah, you started my day with that. So that was in my head all day. How oh, am I going to whittle down... My love of this to five things. Right, right. <laughs> um, and the X-Men list was the biggest. The Batman list was pretty easy. I mean, it was still a big list, but it was pretty easy to find those two that were just, no, nah, these are great. Um, so the X-Men list was huge, but what I came up with at the end of the day is 
the modern take, right? It's ah. House and Powers of X by Jonathan Hickman, uh, Russell Dowderman, um, and various other artists. But uh, it is a beautiful story, not only because it retconned things in a way that made sense within the story that doesn't change anything about what you've read up to this point, but it told a story that completely changed the entire way we look at mutants and the X-Men. In a, in a, if I'm being unclear, in a great way, right? Um, because the story opens with the X-Men basically declaring uh, that they're a sovereign nation. They're mm-hmm. living on Krakoa, which for those of you out there that are X-Men history buffs, Krakoa, yes, is from Giant Size X-Men number one in 1975. It is a mutant island, a living, sentient mutant island that uh, in the past was a villain in the Giant Size X-Men from 1975 was a villain. Um, But Xavier, Magneto, they all kind of came to an understanding with it, um, and they live on it now. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, they have declared themselves a sovereign nation. Uh, Magneto in the opening issue, Magneto has uh, Magneto is one of my favorite X Men characters because again he's very tragic, fucking awesome character. Um, though. But he has a moment where he's taking world leaders on a tour of their country, their new nation, and their yeah. business, and one of the things he says to them on the last one of the last panels on one of the last pages of the first issue is, uh, "While you slept." The world has changed. You have new gods now. So basically what this story was is the mutants literally do believe that they are the next step in evolution. And when you look at the history of evolution from, you know, Cro-Magnon man to Homo sapien, uh, the introduction of a new subspecies almost immediately is followed by the extinction of the previous. Now, Back then, it was because we were feral, and we didn't understand, and we feared what we didn't understand, and we had to destroy it. And the X-Men have dealt with a lot of that. The humans fear them. They don't understand them, and they lash out at them. But they are the next step in evolution. The planet will be theirs one day. They will outlive humanity. Absolutely for sure, they will outlive humanity. So Krakoa is a way to say, we're going to wait it out. We're gonna, this is our planet. We are the next step in this human chain of evolution. And we're willing to wait it out for a few centuries while you kill each other. But after that, it's ours. We're going to keep it. We're going to take it. It's our planet. Uh, so <laughs> uh, the story weaves an interconnected tale. But going into number two, we're introduced to, reintroduced to Moira McTaggart. Mm-hmm. And Moira is someone we're all familiar with. She worked on Muir Island. She's a scientist, geneticist, a friend to the X-Men. She dated Professor Xavier for a while. Yep. Uh, they have a son together, David, who is Proteus in the in the comics. Uh, and so what we found out that was the biggest revelation and the biggest retcon, but again, doesn't change anything that you've seen, is Moira McTaggart is herself a mutant. And her mutant ability is reincarnation. Uh, she can live her whole life, and when she dies... She will reset to the moment of her birth, essentially resetting the timeline, the entirety of the timeline, to the moment of her birth with all the knowledge she gained in her previous life. Oh, my God. So (laughs) she spends early parts of her life uh, studying mutation. At one point, she tries to cure it. That's when the Brotherhood of Mutants come and they murder her. That actually happened within the narrative. So, again... These retcons didn't really change anything that you've seen before. It just adds this new layer, which was brilliant. Uh, I, that's something Hickman has always done very well. Yes. Is his retcons are graceful. Yeah. And They're I like, seamless. I, I like that about his writing. Yeah. So she tries different things. In one life, she joined Apocalypse and tried to, like, mm-hmm. kill all the humans. <laughs> In one, she joined Magneto to the same effect, tried to kill all the humans. Uh, but she comes to an understanding that... When AI rises to the point where Nimrods are born, the mutants are extinct. That's something she learns from her lives. So she takes it upon herself uh, because she's seen this division between them, and that's led to heartache and death and genosha and all of these things that have been terrible. So she takes it upon herself to unite them, uh, to say, like, look, it's one species. 
this petty thing that we're ha- we're having between us, it needs to stop. Mutants need to be united or we're not going to survive. And so that's what she does. They create Krakoa. They, we have Xavier send a telepathic message to the entire... I've been getting chills just talking about All it. mutants. I mean, and I mean, he's like, come seriously. on. This is home. He sends a telepathic message to the entire world. Yep. Uh, and it was an Xavier that... Look, we know who Xavier is at this point. Uh, it was an Xavier we'd never seen before. It was a man who... He starts off his little, his little soliloquy to the, all the people of the earth by saying, I had a dream of peaceful coexistence between mutants and humans. But over years and years and lives and lives, you have shown me that dream is a lie. So, uh, together with the mutants here, we have created plants that are going to make your lives better. So, we, we have drugs that will eliminate most diseases. We have drugs that will extend your lifespan, that will help you live a more comfortable life. But these are, in, in the past, we would have given these gifts to you for free. But that is not the case anymore. In exchange for these gifts, the sovereignty of mutants is recognized. All mutants that have been persecuted by humans will be given a period of amnesty to come to Krakoa and live among us. We will no longer be judged by man's laws. We will be judged by mutant laws, right? So mutants that were in prison had to be released. The United Nations ratified this. They were, they were declared sovereign, right? This mm-hmm. is their nation. Um, and it's just, it does this, the powers of X side of it does this weird time travel story where we show a far future of one of Moira's lives that is just bonkers with humans, uh, combining their DNA with machinery and reaching an apex and a war breaks out. But one of the things that was just so cool about the story was seeing characters like Apocalypse come to Krakoa and shake hands with Professor Xavier in peace, sinister. Uh, All of them, Exodus, Proteus, all of these people that have been such villainous people in their lives coming together. Uh, and and the, the apocalypse thing had a great moment because he comes and Wolverine is the first one to approach him, which is just hilarious to look at because he's tiny and apocalypse is giant, huge, uh, Hulk sized character right. that he is. Uh, and Wolverine basically says, "So all of this division, this us versus you, it ends today. If you want to be here, if you want to live among us, it has to be in peace." And apocalypse responds with, "Why would I ever try to stop you?" You've become everything I ever wanted you to be, my children. I'm proud of you. Because Apocalypse does see himself as the alpha. Right. He is the first mutant. The original, yes. And Krakoa, when when he gets to Krakoa, Krakoa welcomes him. Because he was there long ago. He is familiar with the island, right? The island welcomes him like a a long-lost brother coming home. It's brilliant. And they they come up with their mutant laws. uh, Three... Laws that will govern their society. Uh, A mutant shall not kill a human. That is law one. Law two is respect the sovereignty of this land. Because while Krakoa is allowing them to live there, it is not theirs. They do not own it. Krakoa is a living thing. Right. He's allowing them to claim spots there, but it's still a living thing. So respect the sovereignty of this land. And... The fourth or the third law is make more mutants. Basically telling everybody, get to boning. Be fruitful and multiply. Get to boning. We got to make more mutants. They also, combining the powers of five very special mutants, Hope, Proteus, Gold Balls. I know that sounds, this is a weird name. Uh, (laughs) uh, And a couple of others. I don't remember all five of them. They call them the five. They uh, defeat death. The mutants find a way through mutant power and Professor Xavier's backing up of the telepathic imprints of mutants to end death. Mutants will no longer be governed by the laws that man is governed by. Even life and death. Death is no longer an impediment to them. You know, that seems like, oh, that seems like something that makes the story have less impact. It does not. I mean, recently in the Avengers X-Men Eternals crossover that they did, we saw the reaches of what that can be, and it's brilliant. I mean, it is insanely amazing. Insofar as we were reading one of the issues of House of X, and at the end of the issue, literally all the main X-Men die. 
Just brutally dead. Wolverine, Cyclops, Jean, Nightcrawler, Iceman, Angel. They're all dead. <laughs> Only to open the next issue with them being resurrected. Which was the first time it had been shown to us. So you get to the end of that issue, you're like, what is happening? You're like, no, 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 no. killed no. every major character. Those are the mainstays. We yeah. need those. And then we resurrect them in the very next issue. It's brilliant. It is something that is beautiful. Uh, they are in the process. I mean, it's going to take years and years to get their population back to where it, it is. But they are in the process of resurrecting every mutant that's ever been killed. Oh, my God. All the mutants on Genosha that got killed by the Sentinels. That's fucking I mean, crazy. Literally millions of mutants died on Genosha. They're all going to come back. And it's going to take years, but they're every day bringing more and more of them back. So oh we got to gosh. have characters come back that we hadn't seen in forever. Cyclops and Havoc's long lost brother Vulcan, that was like the emperor of the Shi'ar Empire for a while, is back. Jamie Braddock is back. All of these really interesting characters that had really cool arcs, they're back. That's fucking crazy. And we just tell new stories with them. It's fantastic. That is exciting. Yeah. Like, that's one of the things that's been exciting about comics. Now, there, there are certain characters that I'm glad never got brought back because it made their death mean something. And uh, Joe Perez talked about this often. He's like, original Captain Marvel or dead. Marvel. Yeah. Yep. He's like, won't ever come back. He's like, and he shouldn't. He did. Oh, he Sorry did. Sorry to say. <laughs> Damn. Jenisvel is back. Marvel, he's back. That's bullshit. <laughs> let people die of cancer and let us, de- you know, live with their absence. God damn. Also, he did come back for a short time during Avengers vs. X-Men. I guess he uh, did, didn't to he? To pass the mantle of Captain Marvel to Carol and then die again. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> didn't really need you for that dick. No, but it was still a cool little it was. It was a cute thing, whatever. The Phoenix <laughs> resurrected the entire planet. He was dead on the planet, so he was back. Oh, okay. And then he... He said, carry on. He told Carol, carry on. Keep our name alive. And then he uh, went off to fight a big iron thing, and, and he died. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> All right, so I'm dying to know. Number one. Lock and key. Really? Yes. Are you, are you messing with me? I swear to God. Really? I mean, that it's, is, it's literally right down there. That is not what I expected. Oh, well, that I really expected your number one to be a Spider-Man story. It's not. It's lock and key. Um, explain. Okay. So <laughs> that was when I, when I started working at the shop, that mm. was the book club book. Okay. And, uh, I was like, is this any good? And John Perks was like, you need to read that. And I, look, I'm not going to deny you lock and key is good. It's just surprising. Well, I, I, I took it home and I'm reading it and I watched this fucking savage attack on this family happen in the first few panels and then I watch a little kid drop dead, but not for real. And, like, all this crazy stuff is happening. And I was so hooked in that. So I flew through that first trade. And I start, I start <laughs> going through uh, the second trade because it was already done. I, like, I was yeah, way late to the party six here. Six volumes, I think. It was six volumes. Yeah. And, yeah, it, it, it was short. I think it happened in, like, 2008, something like that, right around there, 2010. Isn't that when they did it? Probably, yeah. I feel like because I feel like it was still going on, or at least the final volume was when I started working for the company, and that was 2012. That that that's probably right then. But I think it was finishing up. Yeah, that's yeah. probably right then. So, yeah, I, I see all these crazy things happen. I get totally sucked into this first book, and like this family basically going to confront the sins of their father, more or less, was kind of the whole basis for the story. And it wasn't, right. you learn that it's not just the sins of the father, but all of their fucking ancestors, that's what they're dealing with. And there's these like cool, cutesy, cute things that happen because they're, they're exploring the unknown in like a huge sense. Sure. They're literally being exposed to magic for the first time. Yeah. There's a key that allows you to walk inside your own brain. Right. <laughs> One, how it's done is so brilliant. <laughs> they're literally opening their each other's heads up and shoving books and stuff in it. They're like, now you know, motherfucker. Yeah. It's so good. So I, I get through the first one, through the second one, through the third one, and this is like all very, very quickly. We didn't have the fourth book at the store. And okay. I was like, John, we, we have to... <laughs> We have to, and he's like, need my fix, man. He's like, let me see if one of the other stores has it. So he's calling around. We get it. And I'm like, it's not going to fucking get here till, you know, Wednesday or something like what? This isn't good. (laughs) So finally it shows up. I fucking, 
it, this is right around uh, Christmas time. Or the, no, it's Thanksgiving. It was like Thanksgiving at this point. Okay. I go to my mom's for Thanksgiving. I have book six. I finish it there. And I was, I laid my head down and I was like, I felt so just taken back by what I had experienced in that series. Sure. I was like, this is not what comic books are or not what they had been. Right. And it was so refreshing to me and like getting all those feels out of it for the very first time. Oh yeah. Loved it. Oh, I remember my first initial reactions when I read the book. It's so fucking good. It's interesting too, because it's written by Joe Hill. Yeah. Stephen uh, King's son. Yeah. I was going to say, if you guys are unfamiliar, Joe Hill is Stephen King's son. Look up a picture of Joe Hill. He looks like Stephen King. It's kind of weird. He's just almost 80s. like they're related. He's just eighty Stephen King. Yeah, but it's almost exact, right? It's I, like, do I look like my father? Yes, but there are key differences that separate <laughs> us. They are the exact. He cloned himself. That's I mean, his probably. <laughs> but yeah, I would argue I like Stephen King. I've read most of his books. Joe Hill's better. I would argue Joe Hill is a better writer than Stephen King. Uh, not because what Stephen King does is bad. Stephen King just oftentimes falls into the same setting, right? And the same characters. He's got his same thing that he does. Towns. Joe Hill's much better at building a world, I think, than Stephen King has ever been. And Lock and Key is the best example of that. Oh, it's fucking fantastic! Yeah. Well, ever since Entertain the Geeky started, I was like, give us, a, give us a show, a movie, something. So then, finally, twenty twenty <laughs> comes around, and we get it, and they basically did everything in season one. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck are you guys going to do next? <laughs> so they do, and like, admittedly, I didn't finish the, uh, no, I did finish the last season. Never mind. Yeah, I did finish the last season. I haven't watched the show at all. I don't want to watch the show. <laughs> so I, season one is good. Okay. Netflix just has this habit of deviating too far from the source material. Joe Hill was, he was there for it. I understand that, and so were the guys. So were the guys who uh, who made Avatar, but they walked away too because they're deviating from the source material. Mm. Oh, fuck. I thought that was because they had a disagreement uh, with their Dragon Prince show. No, no, no. They were they were going to be part of that live action Netflix. Yeah, no, no, no. no Avatar: I... Last Airbender story, and they walked away because they want to deviate too far from what the guys, the creators, wanted it to be. I wonder what that is. The Witcher is another example. This just happened this week. Yeah. Right. Henry Cavill is leaving and not going to play Geralt of Rivia anymore. And Liam Hemsworth is going to play Geralt now. First of all, that was when I heard that, I was just like, you picked the wrong Hemsworth. First of all, if you want to find somebody that's comparable to Henry Cavill, you got to go with Chris. <laughs> I don't know, man. They're... Liam's not one of the buff Hemsworths, you know? I think he will be just fine in that department. He's a he's a big, good looking dude. Yeah, but Cavill is just Cavill is Superman. He's tall. So is Hem. So is Chris. Like they just have the same body type, where it's real heavy up here. But they carry themselves so different. I I don't think. Well, sure. I'm not saying Chris Hemsworth say, should play the character. I was going to say I don't think. Chris what Hemsworth, I'm saying is, if you're going to go with a Hemsworth, you pick the wrong one. <laughs> I think it'll be okay. Um, I don't. I'm not going to watch anymore. Well. I thought how Henry Cavill hand, handled it was fucking brilliant. Henry Cavill, the, 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 but as we started hearing him talk about it, and we started hearing news about what's going on behind the scenes, right. he wants he's a fan of the books. He's a fan of the video games. Yeah. He likes the story that they told. And we've heard this from the very beginning. Henry Cavill has been the voice of, no, that's not right. It should be like this. Throughout the entire, keeping us grounded within the narrative that's already been established. And Netflix, again, wants to deviate from that, which ultimately they won that argument and he's out. Yeah. Well, I mean, see, for now, like he wasn't Superman either anymore. Yeah, he's Superman again now, though. Yeah, now he is. And he's like, I'm going to go fucking talk to well, James okay. Gunn because James Gunn is DC. Okay, but here's the thing, right? Why make the announcement that you've recast the character if there was a chance you're not going to recast the character? To stir up the media. Because we never like made any time. announcements about a new Superman. No, but we We've knew, been left in limbo about who was going to play Superman, and knew, now Cavill's back. We knew he wouldn't be Superman is basically what was alluded to. 
No, we didn't. He had basically said, I'm probably not going to be doing it anymore. Probably is not definitively. Uh, fair enough. Fair right? enough. But they if- never, DC and Warner Brothers never actually made a definitive statement about it because they weren't sure. It was up in the sure. air. Also, if you watch Peacemaker, they clearly, like the, the, the person who's in the background that's silhouetted is clearly Henry Cavill's body style in the Superman costume. Well, you mean Superman? His body style is fucking Superman. <laughs> I understand what he you're saying. I'm just Superman. saying, when they put him in the background shaded, sure. that was clearly supposed to be Henry sure. Cavill. Because they weren't sure. So they never made a definitive statement. Netflix has come out and said, Cavill's out, Hemsworth is in. Yeah, well, I think when they get their fucking petition from everybody... See, this is, this is where we as fans are weak. Let me explain. If you don't like a decision that somebody like your Netflix or something like that makes... You can cancel the subscription. Oh, I like plenty of things on Netflix. I'm just not going to watch Witcher anymore. Sure, and that's fair. (laughs) Let it get canceled that way. I I go a little harder than that, so I I canceled Disney Plus for like two years. Why? What was the the straw that broke your back there? Yes, I I will explain. So when they fired uh, the Cara Dune lady, I was like, I was like, dude, she was fucking posting shit on social media. Who cares? Who cares? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do a whole discussion on what she was saying or anything sure. like that. My whole thing was, I'm like, I felt like that was an attack on free speech. That was how I looked at it personally. Sure. So I didn't pay for it for two years. I got it free for a year when I bought a uh, fight on ESPN. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I was like, all right, and I called my buddy because I had been stealing his for the past year, and I was like, buddy, hey. Well, so here's my thing about Cara Dune, right? Yeah, shoot. Was it detrimental to the series to get rid of her? No. Uh, no, and that, that, no. So that, that wasn't my issue, though. I was like, if a company is going to take a stance that you can't voice your opinion, I'm like, I don't want to give that company my money. I didn't pay to see a Marvel movie in that time. I didn't wear any fucking Marvel shirts. I understand what you're saying. I also think there is lines. When you work for Disney... You, you have to maintain a certain caliber of character, well, I, see, and I, they expect that. I would argue, and I would argue that it's in your contract. I would argue when Spider Man, when Tom Holland was at the children's hospital dressed as Spider Man, that was part of his contract. When <laughs> outreach, yeah. So the the part that I would argue there is, it's I don't believe it is. Uh, you have to maintain a certain level of image you have to maintain whatever the company's beliefs are as a whole at that point in time which is typically true of a show or right, a movie but but what we don't know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is if that maintaining of because what we've heard of some of the people that have worked for Marvel mm-hmm. is like no it's in your contract that you have to maintain a certain image while right. you're under contract to them sure you agree to say i'm going to be this person right that's fucking and that it. is, but but your you, what your argument was sure. is that it's censoring sure. free speech. If you signed a contract, you already gave it away. You you literally violated that contract, I which mean, means they fired you for violating the contract, not because of what you said. Would you? Yeah. Mm, this is but, you, but it's a it's a line, man. I, I hear what you're saying here. On this side of it, I agree with you. We should be able to say whatever we want to say. On this side of it, it's a business. And they have to maintain a certain image, and I'm sure they expect that of their... In fact, I'm not even sure. Stars have told us that those things are in their contracts. My my issue with the Disney image is it it, it changes pretty rapidly. A few years ago, when uh, Gravity Falls came out, for example, sure, they didn't want a gay character in the show, an openly gay character. They actually told Alex Hirsch he can't be this gay. That was a few years ago. Now they're like, hey... You got to put more gay characters in it. I'm like, guys, why, 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 why don't you just let these people be creative and make their art? Because I think and shut the fuck up. Because and I think that let the, creators create. I agree, but I think that public perception of these things changes over time, and the onus is on companies, corporations, and media companies to keep up with that. See, and I think the onus is on us to keep up with it, not on them i don't give a shit what disney thinks about anything yeah but i think but 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 here's here's an example right i've i've said this many times i think i've said this in an episode of the show everyone Mm -hmm. i don't care what your race sexual orientation how you identify everyone should be able to go to a movie and see themselves 
be able to watch a show and see themselves. Sure. Which means... Said that on the last episode. <laughs> those things that we create have to run the gamut across all spectrums. I don't think it's... They feel that they have to do that. I think it's what is right I, to do. I hear what you're saying here. And this is where I would call on an individual to look at what unites us and not what makes us the same. I can look at any person, any person, regardless of where they are, where they came from, or anything like that, and sure. see things in them to admire and see that in myself. And that's that's just being... I, that's just having, I, I think, a pretty basic level of perception. I think, but I think there's several people, and I'm not even just talking about recently, mm -hmm. right? History has shown us that that's not true. That there are some people that have been so oppressed by society that it's impossible for them to sit there and watch their oppressor and relate to him. Hmm. They can't. They can't see themselves in something admirable. Not when that something represents the oppression they've dealt with. I see. You know what I mean? There's a reason Black Panther needs to be up there. Not a black guy. I'm not either, but I would argue. I fucking love but black I would argue, Panther. But I, would ar I do too. I'm not a black guy, but I would argue mm -hmm. that were I, it would kind of be hard for me to relate to the symbol of America, the white man. I'm just <sighs> saying. Uh, when what you see in that is what has oppressed you, how do you relate to your oppressor? I hear what you're saying there, and the thing that I would argue in that is that you see somebody trying to do good and better, and that's the part that you look at. Like, I, Look, I'm not saying Captain America is a racist. Right. He's no, not. I, I get that. Captain America respects all beings and life yes. and whatever you want to be. But he is all that is America. We cannot see the perspective that they have. No, they we will can... never be able to see it, so we will never understand what it is to look at the symbols of oppression up on the screen. Sure. Because sure. we're white. We're white guys. We can't think in that way. And I'm not saying that, you, you know... The, the... That we were slave owners and we were these awful right, exactly. people. I'm not yeah. saying we're horrible people. I'm just saying we can't relate to it in the same way. Sure. I don't know what the black guy sees when he's watching Captain America or Iron Man. I know what I see, but I don't know what he sees. Gotcha. I don't know what the gay person sees when he's watching Black Panther. Sure. You know, I don't know. But I do think that everybody deserves to have characters that represent them. And their lives, their interests. And I think, I think that's the thing that makes characters in and of themselves interesting is that they come from different walks of life sure. and things like that. So that's what makes them enticing to me as a reader. Yeah. To well, I think the, to kind of wrap it all up, right. the comic industry as a whole, right, these stories that we've sat here and talked about for an hour here yeah. have definitely influenced who I think we've become in our lives, how we look at the world, how we relate to other people within our orbit for has sure. definitely been influenced by this. And I would argue more people should be into this hobby because it's it's good to look at other perspectives. It really is. How do we not end on that? Well, I, that, I think that's kind of to bring it all to a close there. It's important. 